already one, yeah, it's already one o'clock and I welcome all of you to the second day of our webinar series on recent advances in pediatrics. On day one, we talked about the intensive care. We had wonderful three discourses by Dr. Neera Jaran Anand, Dr. Nishan, uh, no, sorry, Dr. Siddharth, and Dr. Vishal Punia. Now today, we have switched gear and we are going to the young children, very young ones, we are going to neonatology. And in neonatology, we look forward to the three lectures today, one by Professor Mala, second by Dr. Shalini Tripathi, and the third by our dynamic senior resident, uh, Dr. Rajiv. So I hand over to Dr. Arpita, who is actually the anchor and who is coordinating this program. And now Dr. Arpita will take forward from here. I request all of you to keep yourself muted and um, enjoy the academic feast, which we have tried to prepare for all of you. Over to Dr. Arpita. Thank you, ma'am. A uh, very good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of Department of Pediatrics, KGMU, I, Dr. Arpita, welcome all of you today to day two of our webinar week in recent, uh, recent advances in pediatrics. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each one of you for taking out time from your busy schedule to attend our uh, uh, webinar. And as many of you are aware that we have a series of lectures concerning neonatology, uh, for you today and without wasting much of your time and coming between you and learning, I feel so honored and privileged to call upon our first speaker. She really needs no introduction. Dr. Mala Kumar, professor and in charge of neonatal unit, Department of Pediatrics, KGMU. I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, you have to allow me to share my screen, Arpita. You can share it. You just share it. You are not post disabled participant screen sharing. Arpita, allow kar do. Arpita, can you do it? Or do you need assistance? I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Ma'am, uh, please try now. Okay. Uh, am I audible and visible? Is yes, my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So today we're going to talk about a very simple uh, issue, which is anemia of prematurity. It is a often neglected issue. We often don't pay much attention to it. That's why I've chosen it for today's uh, webinar. One minute. So the contents of today's talk are going to be the dynamics of erythropoiesis, physiological anemia of infancy, the definition of anemia of prematurity, incidence of anemia of prematurity, clinical features of the same, how to investigate a patient with anemia of a suspected anemia of prematurity, the differential diagnosis, prevention, and management of anemia of prematurity. And we're also going to talk about a case scenario, something that happened in our NICU. And uh, we would like, we learned a lot from that and we'd like every, uh, to share our learning with others. So the case was like this. This little baby was admitted with us on three occasions. He was a 28 weeks gestation baby, male baby, with a birth weight of 950 grams. He was one of a twin, the smaller one. He was delivered at home and he fell sick on the very first day 
and he got admitted in some other hospital. He came to us on day three of life and stayed with us till day 57 when he asked for a, a DOPR because the other twin was at home and he was sent home with a diagnosis of 28 weeks preterm small for gestational age baby with early onset sepsis with pyogenic meningitis. For 12 days, the baby stayed at home and then he came to the OPD on day 17. When he came to the OPD, we saw that it was my OPD and we saw that this child was looking lethargic and he looked very pale and there was edema on his feet. So we admitted this patient. When we admitted him, we found that he was anemic. He was transfused blood and those were the days of lockdown. So the parents wanted to go home quickly because the other twin was at home and they didn't feel very safe to be in the hospital. So the child stayed with us for around 48 hours and then went home. Then he was admitted again the, after one day. And this time uh, he was diagnosed as uh, sepsis, again anemia and extra uterine growth retardation. So certain things happened with this patient, which we'll talk about later. So keeping this patient in mind, a 28 weeks gestation, 950 grammar, born at home. That's an, another important thing to note that he was born at home and he was admitted with us from almost the beginning day three and yet he developed anemia for which he was investigated and we finally made a diagnosis for his anemia. So with this background, I like to talk about certain things. So there are some interesting facts that I'd like to share. Infants with a gestational age of less than 28 weeks receive a mean of four to five RBC transfusions during their initial hospitalization. And it may range from zero to 10 transfusions per baby. 50% of all RBC transf uh, transfusions administered to very low birth weight babies are given in the first two weeks of life. That is the time when they are very ill and a number of investigations have to be done with 70% administered by the first month. For a 1000 gram infant, six to seven ml of blood drawn for laboratory testing is equivalent to one 450 ml adult whole blood donor unit. We often don't remember this. So these were some things that I wanted to share. And how does one define anemia in units? Anemia, we say that a baby is anemic if his hemoglobin is less, the mean uh, is less than the mean for that gestational age and postnatal age minus 2SD. So mean minus uh, hemoglobin level of mean minus 2SD qualifies for anemia. So also important to remember what is the site of collection of hemoglobin, uh, of blood for hemoglobin because capillary blood hemoglobin is higher than venous blood hemoglobin. So if you are following certain guidelines for transfusion, it's important for us to know whether the blood that was drawn for hemoglobin determination was capillary or venous uh, blood. So you can see from the chart here that at one hour, the, uh, at one hour of age, the difference between capillary and venous hemoglobin is as much as 3.6 grams. And by the time the baby is three weeks old, uh, the difference is still around 1.1 gram per deciliter, which is quite a bit. Now a few words about erythropoiesis. So initially, uh, uh, erythropoiesis happens, begins in the yolk sac. After that, the liver takes over. And finally, the bone marrow chips in. And after birth, the bone marrow is the main site for erythropoiesis. The stimulus for erythropoiesis, we all know, is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is produced by the liver solely, initially. And then in the third trimester, the kidney also takes up the function of uh, production of erythropoietin. It's important to look at this graph to see that initially, when the baby is inside the womb, the 
uh, hemoglobin is primarily fetal hemoglobin. I just try to uh, get the pointer. One minute. Ah, so initially, when the baby is in the womb, at around 28 weeks of gestation, we find that around 90% of the blood is going to be uh, is uh, going to be uh, fetal hemoglobin. Here, this red line is gamma chain. This is the alpha chain. So at around 28 weeks of gestation, the fetus has around 90% of his hemoglobin as fetal hemoglobin. While at birth, a term baby has 60% of his total hemoglobin as fetal hemoglobin. Now this is important to remember because a baby who was born preterm, let's say at 30 weeks or 28 weeks, his has primarily fetal hemoglobin, uh, unlike a baby who was born at term which has its own repercussions. Now let's look at uh, what happens to EPO over uh, this entire period of gestation. So initially erythropoietin is synthesized by the liver. So the fetal liver is the site for synthesis of erythropoietin. And gradually this um, function of production of erythropoietin uh, is taken up by the kidney so that if a baby is in the third trimester, uh, there may be 50% of production of EPO by the liver and 50% by the kidney. Now, the important thing to remember is that the set point of oxygen for liver to start producing EPO is much lower as compared to the set point of the kidney, which means that a fetus, when... Uh, exposed to hypoxia will have the ability to produce less EPO. So as compared to a full-term baby whose capacity to produce EPO would be more because the kidney has taken over a substantial part of the production of EPO. So if a baby is delivered preterm somewhere here, then his liver is the main organ where erythropoietin is being uh, synthesized. So since the set point of the liver for a generation of uh, EPO is lower, uh, such a small baby will be producing less of erythropoietin. So if there'll be less erythropoietin, there'll be less stimulation of the bone marrow, and so less RBCs will be formed in a preterm baby. Then let's look at the oxygen dissociation curve. So here, if, you, if we look at the oxygen dissociation curve, we see that when fetal hemoglobin is the predominant one, hemoglobin, then the curve shifts to the left. When the uh, curve shifts to the left, then oxygen affinity uh, of fetal hemoglobin is more as compared to adult hemoglobin. So it doesn't offload oxygen easily. So babies who are born preterm will be more hypoxic even after delivery. Then look, let's look at the erythrocyte lifespan. Adults, the RBC lives for 120 to 100, 110 to 120 days. Term neonate is 60 to 90 days. But a poor preterm neonate, his RBC lifespan is also smaller, 35 to 50 days only. Then let's look at the blood volume. Preterm newborns, they have 100 ml per kg of intravascular volume as compared to full-term babies and older infants. So if the blood volume, intravascular blood volume is more, then there will be, the hemoglobin percentage would be lesser. So they are more prone to developing uh, anemia. So if we just look at this, the rise and fall of hemoglobin, during gestational period, hemoglobin increases as the fetus matures, as he comes into the third trimester, and after delivery, the hemoglobin levels they again fall, 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 and then they begin to increase again. We'll see uh, what happens because of this fall after babies are born, when they are term, and when they are preterm. Now let's look at these indices. They are very interesting also. So this is for a baby who is born at 26 to 30 weeks of gestation, and here is a term baby. So we can see that the hemoglobin is consistently increasing as the gestational age is increasing. And then let's look at the reticular side count. Reticular side count is higher when the, uh, at uh, smaller gestations and even at term, 
the uh, reticular side count of up to seven may be considered is considered as normal. But after that, you can see that the reticular side count also decreases. That means the bone marrow is not getting enough of stimulus uh, to produce enough erythropoietin and to produce more reticular sites and eventually RVCs. So all this keeps happening in these uh, babies term as well as preterm. So now let's look at the genesis of physiological anemia of infancy, which happens in term infants. In utero, the SpO2 is 45%. EPO production is high and hemoglobin percentages are high. We've already seen that. After birth, hemoglobin A to hemoglobin F ratio increases. 2-3 DPG levels are higher in RBCs with hemoglobin A. So hemoglobin A releases, to, uh, releases its oxygen readily to the tissues. And so the very, uh, the very stimulus to produce erythropoietin is decreased. And so EPO production declines. And this is primarily the reason why term babies develop physiological anemia of infancy. Now let's see what happens in a preterm baby. So in a preterm baby, this baby develops anemia of prematurity. The contributing factors are physiological ones that are similar to, a little different to those for term babies and certain non-physiological contributors, which are very, very important. And they overshadow these physiological contributors, actually. So the physiological contributors for development of anemia of prematurity in preterm babies are the rapid rate of growth as compared to a full-term baby, lower hemoglobin percentage at birth. We've already seen all that. Shorter RBC lifespan as compared to term babies a shift, a leftward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve at birth because they have more fetal hemoglobin, a lower set point of tissue oxygen sensor in the fetal liver versus the kidney and which causes low levels of, lower levels of plasma erythropoietin and certain cardiovascular factor, uh, factors like the PDA closing or remaining open for some time. Now, the non-physiological contributors are laboratory blood loss, which is a big, big cause for this anemia of prematurity. We keep letting out blood from this little baby whose total blood volume is only 100 ml per kg and his total weight is even less than 1 kg. Then inadequate nutrition is a very important factor. Uh, the, fact, the, uh, the components which are especially uh, worth mentioning are the protein intake the iron, vitamin A, folic acid, B12, supplementation of these uh, premature babies, inadequate uh, supplementation uh, will contribute to development of anemia of prematurity. Then hemorrhage, we all know that preterm babies may be hemorrhaging, may be an intraventricular hemorrhage, may be a hemorrhage because of sepsis, and then infection is also a big uh, contributor for anemia of uh, prematurity. So uh, one of the non-physiological factors which was responsible for anemia of prematurity was phlebotomy blood loss. So if you look at this graph, we see that maximum phlebo uh, phlebotomy blood loss occurs in the initial few weeks after birth. This is understandable. These babies may be very sick. They could be having RDS. They could be having infection. They could be having an open PDA. So you're letting out blood. You're testing and testing and testing. And as much as 10 ml per kg per day of blood may be let out for uh, laboratory workup. And as the days pass, this letting out of, milk, of uh, blood continues, but it lessens substantially. Then the protein intake. Adequate protein intake is absolutely essential for optimal production of EPO and generation of RBCs. And we can see in this graph that if the uh, protein content in the baby's diet, in the neonates, premature neonates diet is not sufficient, then the amount of hemoglobin that the baby will be able to generate, which will be lower. So here we have this line. This is depicting the hemoglobin levels in a baby, a preterm baby who was supplemented with adequate 
proteins, 3.5 to 3.6 grams per kg per day versus this other group of babies who were getting very little uh, protein, just 1.8 to 1.9 grams per kg per day. So here we see that the difference in the hemoglobin levels may be as much as 1 to 1.5 grams just because of the uh, inadequate protein intake in these babies. Then iron supplementation, because of the small size, limited iron endowment occurs at birth, is present at birth, and the rapid rate of growth, iron deficiency is common among preterm neonates, and especially during infancy. So we must supplement all such babies with two to four milligrams per kg per day of iron by the time that they are two weeks uh, old. B12 and folate also along with vitamin E have to be supplemented uh, to prevent uh, anemia of prematurity. And it is absolutely essential to screen these babies for iron deficiency anemia between six and 12 months of age. Babies who are very low birth weight and less than 32 weeks of gestation. Now, if we were to compare physiological anemia of infancy with anemia of prematurity, we would find that physiological anemia of infancy occurs due to physiological causes. We saw that. While anemia of prematurity, non-physiological causes overshadow the, may overshadow the physiological causes. This appears at between 8 to 12 weeks, that is a little later, as compared to anemia of prematurity that appears between 4 to 6 weeks uh, of after birth. Then the nadir is higher for term babies and for those who have physiological anemia, 9.5 to 11 gram per deciliter. While in anemia of prematurity, we may have the nadir as low as 6.5 grams per deciliter. So it is more rapid fall of hemoglobin and it is more substantial drop in hemoglobin for anemia of prematurity. These babies who've got physiological anemia of infancy, term babies are usually asymptomatic despite their physiological anemia. But babies with anemia of prematurity, like the one we saw uh, in our case that I uh, talked about in the beginning, they may be symptomatic. This one needs no treatment, while anemia of prematurity may need treatment. Now, let's uh, define uh, uh, anemia of prematurity. We know a lot about it already, so I think it's time that we could define uh, anemia of prematurity. So it's a hyporegenerative, normocytic, normochromic anemia, which occurs in newborns who are less than 32 weeks of gestation, that is before placental iron transport and fetal erythropoiesis are complete. It usually occurs in the third to fourth week of life. It is accompanied by inappropriately low reticulocyte count and low EPO levels for the severity of anemia. It typically resolves by three to six months of life. And it is the most common cause of anemia at discharge for a neonate, a preterm neonate especially. So what is the incidence of uh, anemia of prematurity? About half of the infants who are less than 32, sorry for that spelling mistake, weeks of gestation develop uh, anemia of prematurity. It is inversely related to the gestational age and birth weight. That is the smaller the baby, the lesser the gestational age, the more chances of anemia of severe anemia of prematurity developing. And uh, race and sex have no influence on the incidence. So what are the clinical features of anemia of prematurity? So the baby may have tachycardia, may have tachypnea, he may be lethargic, like the, uh, the baby who came to us, he may have flow murmurs, he may have respiratory irregularities as apnea accompanied by bradycardia. They could be just poor weight gain despite adequate calories. So the baby is getting adequate calories, 120 kilocalories per kg to 150, maybe 200. Yet the weight gain is poor. Why? Because the protein intake is not adequate. Then he could present with pallor like the baby in our case presented and uh, he may have poor feeding. And on investigation, you may find that he has metabolic acidosis because of tissue hypoxia. 
so what are the causes of neonatal anemia as always causes may be related to blood loss or may be related to hemolysis or may be related to decreased production so anemia of prematurity is this here this hypoplastic anemia that is there is hyporegeneration of uh, rbcs so in this type of anemia you would find that the hemoglobin level is low the reticulocyte count is classically low because it is hyporegenerated the bone marrow is not being able to make uh, synthesize rbcs there is no hemolysis so the bilirubin level is normal in case we are dealing with a hemolytic condition even in this baby he could be having an ongoing hemolysis maybe there was an abo or rh incompatibility and a little amount of hemolysis may be going on in that case you would find that the reticulocyte count would be higher the indirect bilirubin levels would be increased in cases of blood loss uh, this baby could also be a case who is having blood loss maybe is having a gi bleed or something like that then the hemoglobin level is normal if it's an acute blood loss then it may be even normal otherwise if it's a chronic blood loss for example gi blood loss then the hemoglobin level would be low reticulocyte counts may be increased if it is chronic bleed and it may be normal if it is an acute bleed so there is no reason why the bilirubin levels would be high because there is no hemolysis going on these children in case uh, there was acute blood loss would be presenting with shock while shock would usually not occur in this uh, subgroup of patients with anemia so if we were looking at uh, neonatal anemia with uh, it's a good idea to look at the reticulocyte count so if we look at the reticulocyte count and we find that the reticulocyte count is low like in our patient in uh, in patients with anemia of prematurity uh, the reticulocyte count is low because it is a hypo uh, regenerative anemia so the causes may be certain congenital causes which are not so common and it could they could be because of acquired causes so in the acquired causes it is important to remember that infection with parvo b19 infection with rubella infection with cmv nutritional deficiency we have already discussed these may be responsible for uh, anemia in these patients acquired anemia with decreased reticulocyte count so causes of hypoplastic anemia could be diamond blackfin syndrome congenital leukemia a transfer anemia congenital infections osteopetrosis drug induced uh, hypoplastic anemia sepsis nutrient deficiency and anemia of prematurity so what investigations will be like to do we'll do the hemoglobin we'll do the gpp because uh, we want to see whether the how the rbcs are so in anemia of prematurity we would find normocytic normochromic rbcs we'll also like to look at the tlc and the dlc uh, and the platelet count i've forgotten to write this here because we want to see whether there is a pancytopenia or it's only the rbcs that are affected then the reticulocyte count it will be low in cases of anemia of prematurity is always important to calculate the corrected reticulocyte count which is the reticulocyte count multiplied by the observed hematocrit divided by the normal hematocrit it should be more than or equal to 3% this corrected reticulocyte count to maintain stable hematocrit in a growing preterm neonate with minimal phlebotomy process then there is no need to do a bone marrow in all these children who are in whom we are thinking about uh, anemia of prematurity and uh, but if we were to do a bone marrow the it would show that it is a hypoplastic bone marrow serum bilirubin levels would be normal serum epo we don't usually do but if we were to do it then it would be low serum ferritin if you were thinking of a deficiency of iron as being the reason for anemia in this child then we could have done that and it would be normal in cases of anemia of prematurity and lactic acid and the ph after uh, indicating metabolic acidosis that may be present even in children with anemia of prematurity so if we were to come back if i was to come back to this uh, to the case scenario that uh, i presented in the beginning this was baby of aditi who was born at home 
So when a baby is born at home, there is no question of any delayed cord clamping. She was born. He was born at 28 weeks. He was a small for gestational age baby. He was an extremely low birth weight baby, and he was one of a twin. He was admitted with us for almost two months. He got admitted on day three. He had early onset sepsis, meningitis. There was acinetobacter that was cultured from his CSF, and uh, he was fed on express breast milk and he was given supplements because he did not tolerate human milk fortifier. So when one is given supplements, then the supplements don't have protein. That's the problem. So we are supplementing calcium and phosphate and vitamin D and folic acid and iron, but we are not giving protein. And during his initial hospitalization, he received one PRBC when he was on the ventilator. Then he was discharged on day 59, almost when he was two months old. And at that time, on day 59, his hemoglobin was not done. His hemoglobin, last hemoglobin was done when he was 48 days old. And at that time, it was 10.7 grams per deciliter. So this was, this should not have been like this. We should have repeated a hemoglobin before we sent this child home. He was readmitted after 12 days when he came for follow-up in the OPD with complaints of lethargy, with complaints of pallor. And he had fetal edema on examination. That time, his hemoglobin came out to just 6 grams per deciliter. There was inadequate weight gain. And you can see this from this Fenton's growth chart, how this child was born here and slowly over the next two months, he is having, developing extra uterine growth retardation. When uh, he was admitted and he was given uh, RBC transfusions and he was discharged the next day, again, because the parents wanted to go home quickly, and uh, because the other twin was at home and there were these lockdown days. And so he was sent at home. And this time, though the mother was giving EBM up till now, since we saw that this uh, extra uterine growth retardation was occurring and this child had developed anemia, this was anemia of prematurity only, we added preterm formula and supplements. This baby again came to us after 48 hours of being discharged. And this time, he was again lethargic and uh, his sepsis screen was positive and he had pyogenic meningitis. And he was again kept in the hospital for 21 days to treat him for his pyogenic meningitis. During admission, we, uh, we found that on day 82, his hemoglobin was again only 5.9 gram per deciliter. And after a week, this... Uh, figure was again at 5.6 gram per deciliter, despite two PRBC transfusions. So this time, on this day 82, the third time that he was admitted with us, his hemoglobin was 5.9 grams per deciliter. His TLC, his DLC was normal, his platelet count was normal, his GVP was normocytic and normochromic. And reticulocyte count, despite this much of anemia, was less than 0.5%. Iron status was normal, ferritin was normal, was increased maybe because of the sepsis that he had. B12 folic acid was all normal. Serum albumin was just 2.1 gram per deciliter. And, uh, but his kidney function tests and urine examination were normal. We tested him for parvovirus as well as for CMV, both of which were negative. Stool local blood was also done and that was also negative. So here we had this child who was admitted with us three times. We did make a mistake. We did not do a hemoglobin when he went home on the first instance. And because of the lockdown, he did not come to us earlier. He was called after uh, two days of discharge, but he couldn't make it. And then when he did come, then this is all that has happened to him. So I think this is a learning uh, thing, learning uh, experience. And that's why I wanted to share it with all of uh, you, so that we don't make these mistakes and we are more careful about uh, these type of patients.
So remember that hemoglobin levels in most infants who have AOP have reached their nadir and are rising by the time discharge is considered. For those few whose hemoglobin levels have not yet begun to rise, weekly evaluation of the infant's clinical condition and hemoglobin levels until the expected rise in hemoglobin levels occurs is prudent. In these situations, reticulocyte counts are very, very informative. They tell us if the reticulocyte count is rising, then it tells us that the bone marrow is now functioning and is making RBCs. So how do we manage AOP? Prevention is the biggest thing. Delayed cord clamping or cord milking. Blood sampling from the umbilical cord or from the placenta to prevent blood loss. Then using devices that reintroduce the blood after analysis. There are certain devices which can uh, let out blood from the baby and then that blood after analysis can go back into the baby, thus reducing phlebotomy losses. Then there can be devices to monitor glucose levels subcutaneously rather than pricking the baby every now and then. Devices to monitor uh, carbon dioxide levels with transcutaneous or end tidal uh, volume devices, transcutaneous or intra-arterial measurement of oxygen levels rather than letting out blood all the time and then using micro methods for analysis of these tests. These are some of the things that can be done to prevent anemia of prematurity. Then how do you manage observation and supportive care, PRBC transfusion and erythropoiesis stimulating agents? So observation and supportive uh, care we've already talked about and uh, which we must not ignore. You should have done a hemoglobin when the child was going and the parents should have come back after 48 hours when they were asked to come back. Adequate amounts of vitamin E supplementation, folic acid, iron supplementation must be done for these patients. Then PRBC transfusions are the backbone of babies who are symptomatic or who are on oxygen therapy. And erythropoiesis stimulating agents look very exciting, but as of now, they are not recommended for routine use in anemia of prematurity. So for these transfusions, there is some confusion about whether uh, there should be restricted versus liberal blood transfusion criteria for very low birth weight neonates. So what is the evidence? So White and Triplani et al. in the Pintos trial in 2009, they were the first one to study the long-term effects of restricted versus liberal blood transfusions in very low birth weight neonates. And their composite primary outcome was death or abnormal neurodevelopment at 18 months of corrected age. Then, uh, uh, corrected age. Then uh, they found that uh, this thing, uh, death or abnormal neurodevelopment at 18 months is less in the liberally transfused group. But this uh, difference was not significant. On post hoc analysis of their uh, data, they found that if they reduced the cutoff for MDI from 70 to 85, then liberal transfusions had an upper hand. It was better to liberally transfuse babies if we uh, used a higher cutoff of 85 for the MDI. So this called for more studies and more studies were done. So then we had Triplani, and uh, the others, in, uh, they published in uh, 2020. Then again, Franz et al. Uh, published in 2020. And then these others who also published in uh, 2021. And the ultimate conclusion is that restrictive RBC transfusion is recommended. And it does not affect mortality or neurodisability at 20 month, uh, 24 months of age. And it reduces the number of uh, transfusion significantly. So why do we want uh, to uh, reduce unnecessary uh, transfusions? You know, adult blood lacks fetal blood components unique for development, fetal hemoglobin and circulatory stem, circulating stem cells. So there are more chances of complications in preterm infants like ROP, NEC, IVH, chronic lung disease, and of course, all the transfusion related complications that we already know about. So here are the guidelines which have been published by the British Committee for Standards in 2016. And uh, we, we follow these guidelines in our unit. And it's important to follow these guidelines and not keep 
transfusing babies left, right, and center. And it is also uh, been noted that for asymptomatic infants, if the hemoglobin is less than six gram per deciliter and a reticulocyte uh, count is less than two percent, then even these babies need to be transfused, even if they are asymptomatic. Then practical information for PRBC transfusion. Uh, most of us are aware of these, and it's important to remember that the rate that uh, 10 to 15 ml per kg is transfused. Rate should not be more than 5 ml per kg per hour. Uh, Frusemide should not be routinely given, and ideally, irradiated RBCs should be used, but this cannot be done in our setting. Then uh, feeds need not be stopped in a stable baby during transfusion, and maintenance fluids can be withheld. While uh, if the child is having hypoglycemia or is on inotropes, then we have to continue with the fluids during the transfusion. A word about EPO. It stimulates erythropoiesis. The dose, there's a lot of controversy about this uh, from the dose to the duration to whether it should be given early in the first week of life or should be given later. And a dose of 250 to 400 IU per kg subcutaneously three times a week uh, may be given for 35 weeks or till discharge or for four weeks. And when we are giving erythropoietin, an elemental iron must be added because extra erythropoiesis will need that. Now, as of now, this thing is not recommended. So I'm not going to talk more about it. So several studies have been done whether this EPO should be given early versus late. How does it affect, affect uh, the number of transfusions that are given to babies? Then they also compared early versus late EPO on the development of ROP and they found that the use of early versus late EPO administration did not significantly reduce use of one or more RBC transfusions or the number of transfusions per infant. And statistically significant increased risk of ROP of any grade and a similar trend for ROP of more than stage three occurred with early EPO treatment. And this was of great concern. So EPO as of now is not recommended for anemia of Prematurity, but the problem is not finished. Now, here there are more people who said that whether early erythropoiesis, uh, early erythropoietin administration is better than placebo. And they found that there was a reduction in the number of transfusions, but there was limited clinical benefit of giving early erythropoietin. So uh, it has not been recommended. But that's not the end of the story. Now people thought, let's use high dose erythropoietin and let's give it early and then let's see what's happening. So this was a study which was done by um, Sandra Julital. And here they use a thousand units per kg of erythropoietin. And they found that EPO treatment versus placebo significantly decreased the number of transfusions, cumulative transfused volume and the donor exposure. So they concluded that high dose EPO may be uh, safe and should be uh, given and more trials should be done. But as of now, I'd like to say that EPO is not recommended for anemia of prematurity. So now it's time for the take home messages. So first and foremost, prevent AOP by delayed cord clamping, minimizing phlebotomy losses, adequate protein intake, B12, folic acid, iron, and vitamin E. Monitor extremely preterm neonates for AOP. Monitor. Anna, we faulted here to some extent. And later for iron deficiency anemia between 6 and 12 months of age. Use restrictive guidelines for PRBC transfusion. And EPO is not recommended as of now. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a lucid presentation and explaining so much in detail about the physiology behind anemia of prematurity and as well as the management. I would now like to request, ma'am, if she could take certain queries which are raised in the chat box. Okay. I can't see my chat box, so I'll put okay. my Yes, ma'am. What is the term used for anemia between 32 and 36 weeks? You know, we were talking of this kind of physiological anemia. So sometimes, you know, the upper limit of this 32 for preterm babies is taken as 34. Sometimes they say that babies who are less than 34 weeks of gestation, if they develop this sort of anemia, 
for which there is no other cause and uh, we call that as anemia of the uterus i don't know if there is any specific name for babies between 34 and 37 uh, weeks of gestation for this sort of anemia which is more physiological right ma'am and the next query is also please tell how much amount of blood sampling should be allowed per day to prevent anemia of prematurity actually one can't say that uh, you can only take withdraw 1 ml every day it will depend on uh, what is the need the important thing is not to waste if you need 1 ml then you take 1 ml for example for a culture you can't do for with less than 1 ml but if you are taking 1 ml and you just getting an abg done out of that so then that's superfluous and then if you are puncturing the baby again and again then you are losing a lot of blood so you do it in a planned way do not do too many uh, lobotomies and uh, do only what is really required just don't go on and on for example we, should, we need not have done uh, uh, this thing serum iron levels and serum ferritin levels we'd also send ldh levels so there are many people who are working together and sometimes these things are done so we should only do things that are really required and not just keep letting out blood aimlessly because as i said before taking out a small 6 7 ml from a 1000 grammer is just like taking one unit blood from us so imagine donating one unit of blood every day for the first two weeks of your life you know that's the problem right right now i think with that uh, all the queries are solved thank so, you so much thank you so much for everyone thank you uh with that